Right now, the United States Supreme Court could be deciding the future of pistol braces, bump stocks, forced reset triggers, and a whole lot else when we're talking about the Second Amendment, simply when I say these two words, Chevron Doctrine. Why? The so-called Chevron Doctrine, based on the 1984 U.S. Supreme Court case called Chevron v. Natural Resources Defense Council, is what forces courts to defer to the 438 federal agencies and sub-agencies around the country when those agencies make various rulings in many circumstances. The very existence of the doctrine is up for grabs, and oral arguments are being heard on January 17th, 2024, with the ruling scheduled to be released later this year. What? You haven't heard about this and how it directly impacts the Second Amendment? You came to the right place, guys. Let's get into it. So let's start off with some basics. Congress is the only legislative body that can, of course, enact federal law, right? That's the legislative branch. The executive branch is supposed to be going out to enforce that law. And the judicial branch are the people who not only protects the Constitution from Congress's or the executive branch overstep, but also can go out to interpret that law as well. Okay. However, congressionally passed law, sometimes known as statutes or U.S. code, whatever, can have limits to it. It's impossible for every senator and congressman who's going out there to pass a law to be able to foresee with a high enough degree of clarity that their particular law is going to be reasonably specific enough to apply to every single set of circumstances and fact pattern that could emerge in the days, weeks, decades, you name it to come. That's fair. What Congress did is they basically have delegated a portion of their authority, these various, and when I say various, again, that's 438 federal agencies and sub-agencies, to basically go out there and under certain limited circumstances, according to the Administrative Procedures Act and other laws, they can enact regulatory code, which is not the same as law. Code, law, code, law. Hopefully I helped some people out with that right there. But these agencies can go out there and enact code that cannot overstep what the law says, but it can speak to making reasonable interpretations of that law to allow these agencies to zero in on perhaps certain circumstances, or in many cases, many circumstances, that the law whispers about where maybe these regulatory bodies require something more spoken. I'm not here to defend all this kind of stuff. I'm here simply stating this as an observation to get you up to speed so that now we can start talking about this. We appreciate you, of course, checking out our channel, checking out this video. If you are new here, just found us while browsing through, don't forget to hit that subscribe button to make sure you don't miss any of our future content. The very best thing you can do to help us out drop that like button a strong hit to show your support not only for this channel, but also for the Second Amendment. And of course, look forward to seeing you all in the discussion box below. Not pictured in this video is the rule of lenity because I've covered it many, many times before. But if you want to see another video talking about that in Chevron, let me know in the discussion box. Back to the video. So the Chevron Doctrine itself has not been up before the United States Supreme Court since 2016, so about eight years. However, Since being adopted about 40 years ago now, it has been cited more than 18,000 times by federal courts to uphold rulings made by these agencies. So this is very, very real. Now, I'm not going to spend much time talking about it. Here's a quick synopsis from scotusblog.com. The federal law at the center of the fishing company's challenge is called the Magnuson-Stevens Act. And this act gives the Secretary of Commerce and the National Marine Fisheries Service the power to implement a comprehensive fishery management program. That's their quote. Implement a comprehensive fishery management program. The law also requires that fishery management plans may require that one or more observers be carried on board a vessel for the purposes of collecting data necessary for the conservation and management of the fishery. Okay, so basically in English, commercial fishermen have to carry these observers in order to 
gather data and make sure that the fisheries are being protected. Fine. All right. So pursuant to this law, the federal agency in question, that's the National Marine Fisheries Service folks, issued a rule. So that's rule, codes, that kind of stuff that requires the fishing industry to pay for the costs of these observers ballparked at approximately $710 per day. So the fishing companies led by Loeber Bright Enterprises went to federal court in Washington in 2020 to challenge this rule, arguing that it was not authorized by the Magnuson-Stevens Act. So in other words, the rule was not authorized by the federal code by the law that was passed by Congress. In essence, they're saying, look, this really goes beyond the power that has been given to and delegated to the federal agency by imposing these costs. This is a policy issue, right? This is not a rulemaking. The rule, this oversteps rulemaking by the agency. However, Relying on the Chevron Doctrine, the district court, that's the federal trial court, rejected that argument, holding that the act clearly authorized industry-funded observers in the herring industry. And as a result, fishing industry, you got to suck it up. We're going to defer to the agency on this. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the District Court of Columbia upheld the result, but on a different rational basis. It Two applied the Chevron Doctrine, but this time it concluded that the statute was silent on the question of whether or not the law allows the federal agency to require fishermen to pay for the cost of the observers. But the federal agency's interpretation of the law as obligating the industry rather than the government to bear the costs is a reasonable interpretation under the so-called second step of Chevron, so the Court of Appeals ruled. So basically, Chevron. The fishermen got Chevron. Now, for those who may be confused, there's actually two cases being argued at the same time that has to do with the fact that Justice Jackson actually has to recuse herself on the first case that was brought up due to the fact that she actually sat on the court that shot this down under Chevron initially. So probably for reasons of being able to kind of bring her into the folds, the court fast-tracked a second case that's called Relentless Incorporated versus Department of Commerce. And lo and behold, she's back into it. So in case there's questions as to why are we hearing two cases on the same point, it probably has to do with that. So I hear you saying, Tom, what the heck does this have to do with the Second Amendment? It has everything to do with the Second Amendment. Why? Well, among that lengthy list of 438 federal agencies and sub-agencies is a particular one, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, sometimes more commonly referred to as the ATF. Now, in case you're new around here, the ATF, they like to make rulings that can jump around and seemingly contradict one another. First, for instance, they approve force reset triggers and bump stocks as being devices that do not convert your semi-automatic firearm into a machine gun. Then, the ATF changes their definition of how to define a machine gun convenient, right? Congress didn't change anything, but the ATF changed the rule, changed the regulatory analysis of how they should enforce and interpret and look at things. And lo and behold, suddenly tens and tens of thousands of folks suddenly are felons. That's kind of relevant for the Second Amendment. If you have an agency that can basically do more or less whatever they want, provided that, hey, we're making these reasonable interpretations and these reasonable interpretations can unreasonably change with time and lead to, in my view, unreasonable outcomes. But Chevron, right? Of course, you have to defer to us. This is basically not your fight. As long as we're making reasonable interpretations of what Congress said, good to go. Now, perhaps even more egregious than this is what the ATF did with stabilizing braces and pistols. For those of you who once more are new here, first the ATF ruled that pistols that had an attached stabilizing device were not short-barreled rifles. Why is this relevant? Well, first off, the definition of short-barreled rifle is any rifle or any firearm that's designed to be fired from the shoulder that has an overall length of less than 26 inches or has a barrel length of less than 16. If you do not meet both those qualifications of 26 inches or greater overall length, and 16 inches or greater of barrel length, you now have a short-barreled rifle. Why is that relevant? Well, short-barreled rifles, sometimes called SBRs, are felonies to possess without certain registration and approval and taxes paid in every state 
and is in fact impossible to possess even if you do try to comply with that law in many states. Later, after potentially millions and millions of Americans purchased these devices, the ATF reversed course and said that it is a felony to possess these devices that only years before they said, go ahead, knock yourself out, Joe America, thereby directly exposing millions of law-abiding, honest Americans to a decade or more of prison time to go along with their nifty felony conviction. Now, we have covered these issues in extreme detail here on the channel. Check out my playlist for the ATF if you want to see that. And of course, if you just found us browsing through, don't forget to hit that subscribe button to make sure you don't miss any of our future content. Now, if this sounds crazy to you, then you likely want the Chevron Doctrine to get overturned. While that will not end these and other shenanigans, it will deal a massive blow to the legal toolbox that federal agencies like the ATF rely upon day in and day out in court to bail them out when they reverse course in crazy situations like these, as well as when they just plain old chart course for crazy waters in the first place arguably overstepping what many would say is the Second Amendment, the Constitution, and of course what Congress has enacted. The Chevron Doctrine has been argued to sideline the judiciary and thereby effectively consolidate in certain instances two or even all three branches of government, executive, legislative, and judicial, into various administrative branches. On the pro-Chevron side, because there is a pro-Chevron side, supporters would claim that why do we want uninformed judges making often very technical decisions that impact public policy. Would this not be better left to the experts that can be readily found within these government regulatory bodies like the ATF? If just a few examples that I just gave you from the ATF are any indication, the clear answer is no. We need judicial oversight. Yes, there are flaws with the system, but by sidelining judges and more broadly the judiciary, we have de facto installed a group of individuals that have been chosen largely by the executive branch because it is the executive branch who often appoint the heads of these administrative agencies to basically usurp and take that power from the judicial branch when they make their rulings. What is wrong about a court hearing from experts on either side of an issue to try to determine what is the better one to go with? Why is the government expert the one that is going to be right 100% of the time, as Chevron not only implicitly suggests, but legally demands? I'm not claiming to be an expert when it comes to national fishery law or soon I'm sure we'll be talking about artificial intelligence and all that other kind of stuff. And I'm certainly not suggesting that a particular judge, any judge, is going to be an expert in every single subject field. I'm also not claiming that if Chevron stands, that the Second Amendment is done. You will never find that kind of dramatics and hyperbole here. However, I will say that if Chevron stands, we will face a more difficult road in preserving our rights from an empowered agency whose very existence, many have argued, is to trample those same rights. And that is definitely worth paying attention to. We'll be following this case. Don't forget to hit that like, subscribe button. The like button does more than you can know. Comment down below, what do you think is gonna be happening? I look forward to joining that discussion after this video, of course, goes live. And now to our ever popular quote of the day. This one comes from Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius, quote, the nearer a man comes to a calm mind, the closer he is to strength. We appreciate you all. We will see you in the next video. Thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. If you enjoyed this one, please feel free to check out some of our other great content and we'll see you in the next one.